This is the story of a man or a thing called Nails. Before we get to him, we must speak about a man named Andre Nielsen. Andre Nielsen was an irritable, easy to anger man. He lived in a small town in a small community. He was mostly seen inside his own home and spent very little time on the town. The people in the town rarely talked to Andre. Because of his anger, he was always prone to attack and hurt other people. His criminal history limits to public intoxication and assault and battery. Upon his apprehension by the police, Andre would always confess to his crimes for a lesser sentence in county lockup. In one morning on what seemed to be a drunken fit, Andre went to a local convenience store, bumping into people and screaming at them and knocking down things in the aisles. He caught attention from most of the employees. Fearing for their customer safety and for their products, they immediately dialed 911. They announced on the intercom that all customers should stay away from Andre and all the employees also tried to keep them at bay. By the time the police arrived, Andre was stumbling around the hair and grooming aisle. The police were heading through the aisles and found Andre stumbling towards what appeared to be the exit near the register. To cause less of a scene and a panic, they sent most of the officers to secure the area and sent two officers to get Andre. With his back towards the officers, the two officers called out Andre's name. In a confused state, Andre turned around and revealed what would be a sharp object in his hand. The two officers quickly drew their sidearms, instructing Andre to drop whatever was in his hands. In a drunken confusion, Andre raised whatever was in his hand and started running towards the officers. Without hesitation, both officers shot Andre down, killing him instantly. With bystanders and customers screaming and running away from the convenience stores, the officers began to walk towards Andre's lifeless body. After checking Andre's pulse, they found that the sharp object in his hand was a nail file. After hours of investigations, officers went to Andre's house for further investigations. Officers discovered that Andre lived in a two-bedroom, three-bathroom house. Confusing officers because investigations showed that Andre lived alone and never had a marriage license. Upon investigating the upstairs area, officers found lots of child clothing and toys. A shallow view showed that the toys had been weathered down by age, but a close-up showed that they were purposely damaged. Officers then began to search the basement area. Upon their shock, they find a little boy chained to a radiator. The boy was drenched in sweat stains and scars all over his body, and had a disturbed smell of no weeks of bathing. Officers tried to use whatever tools they had to try to free the boy and bring him to safety. With an ambulance brought on the scene, doctors immediately treated the boy. Upon checkup, the boy showed lots of bruising for restraints and years of abuse. When the boy's shirt was taken off, they discovered that the boy was very malnourished and starved. His skin began to show the outlines of his rib cage. When doctors looked at the boy's hands, they found irregular shapes on his fingernails. The boy's fingernails were almost shaped like an arrow, smooth on each side but pointed at the top. The doctors tried to file down the nails, the boy immediately scratched the doctor's arm. After he was scratched, the doctor backed away. Then, he and the boy were deadlocked in eye contact. The boy then said his first words, These keep me safe. This is either for me or the old man. The doctor then said, You know, no one did ask your name. Do you have one? He turned away, breaking away from the stare down. He then said, Eric. Months had gone by. Eric was recovering from within the hospital, being treated for years of abuse and starvation. Upon that time, Eric was being questioned by child services and the police. Eric did answer their questions but refused to look whoever was asking in their eyes. Eric, in his own words, described his father as a drunken, abusive, miserable son of a bitch. The times where they asked for his mother, Eric responded with, It rarely came up. He would also say, Why should I care about some whore I've never met? After some time in the hospital, Eric was then offered to go to a foster home. Eric hesitantly and reluctantly agreed to go to foster care. While investigating his former father and abuser, no actual birth certificate was found for Eric. With no actual papers from the government, the police had decided that Eric's age would be 13 and his new last name would be Donald's. With his new name, Eric then began to live his life through the foster care system. With his life now in the handle of foster care, Eric was taught the inner workings and meanings of today's society. Eric showed that he was very understanding and cohesive towards others. Two years went by and Eric had turned 15. People started to notice that Eric's body had changed in an unusual way. His skin was unusually pale, and his arms and legs seemed to be longer than his torso. 
They were so tall that it outreached the sleeves in his pants and shirts. People assumed that his disfigurement was caused by his early starvation as a child. Upon a checkup from a doctor, doctors discovered that Eric has Marfan syndrome. Doctors explained that when Eric reaches adulthood, he'll be taller than most people, but he'll have a long history of health problems in the mix. After this was all explained to Eric, Eric may need a lifetime of monitoring and checkups for his condition. Eric asked what she should do. They told Eric that the government would pay for a few free checkups, but they advised that he should wait until he's 18 in order to pay for it himself. Years had gone by. Eric had finally turned 18. He was very tall, almost 6'3". His body seemed very deformed. His skin showed the outlayers of his bones. To pay for treatments, Eric landed a job as maintenance at a local hospital. Because Eric was technically part of the hospital staff, he got special treatment and was looked after for his Marfan syndrome. Years had gone by, it seemed that Eric was cured of his horrible childhood of abuse. He was sociable, was hardworking, and kept maintenance around the hospital. Sometime later, Eric asked if he could be part of the nursing staff on the hospital he worked at. The hospital and medical directors felt it was appropriate that Eric should join their team. On the record, Eric was officially in maintenance, but off the record he was a nurse. Years had gone by, Eric had turned 26 and was caring for patients as a nurse. Sometime later, the hospital went under a police investigation. Police announced that whoever was among the hospital staff was an angel of death. They had explained that an angel of death is a type of criminal who kills people under their own assumption that they are better off dead. The police had explained that there was a large mortality rate that caused suspicion at the hospital. At the beginning, a large number of elderly had passed away at the hospital. Because of their fragile state and their age, it did not arise any suspicions at the time. At that time, a man named Louis McIntyre seeked medical attention for his kidney failures. Upon examinations, they found that his kidneys were suffering due to a lifetime of alcohol abuse. After stabilizing Lewis, the staff asked if he had any family, but Lewis explained that he didn't have any family, children, or friends. With no one to call, the staff hooked Lewis up to life support and gave him a room, and they cared for him for two weeks. Lewis's last day on the hospital was when he was suffering from total kidney failure and the hospital went into code blue. Upon investigation from the staff, they found that Lewis's life support machines had failed at keeping him alive. The hospital declared Lewis's death was an accident. Because he had no one in his life, no one pressed charges. Because of lack of evidence, no arrests were ever made. One staff member anonymously tipped the detective's investigations. The staff members informed the detectives that Eric McNaughtle had been their nurse during their time at the hospitals. The staff member told them that Eric had groomed, bathed, and maintained their patients at the hospital. And what struck odd the staff member mostly is that when Eric would cut the nails of his patients, he would always collect them and store them in little envelopes with their names on it. The police had found that the tip was suspicious, but it wasn't enough to cause for arrest. Weeks had gone by. No casualties occurred at the hospital after the investigations. It wasn't until a mass casualty incident that brought in a group of fourth graders at the hospital. They found that they were poisoned thanks to the lead supply inside the school water system. A few hours in, the children were treated and stabilized after their lead poisoning, but they needed to stay in the hospital for further checkups. The children had stayed in the hospital for three days. All seemed fine at the time. On the fourth day, a nurse had tried to check in on all the children, but found that they were unresponsive and had no pulse. They found that the children had suddenly died overnight. When the police were called in, they detained all the doctors and arrested them for further questioning. When the children were taken in, they were taken into an autopsy and examined by a mortician. The mortician discovered that all the children had died suddenly of morphine overdose. When asked about this, none of the doctors or nurses claimed that they ordered morphine for the children. The mortician also discovered dry blood on some of the children's fingertips. When heard about this, the detectives from the early investigations wanted to talk to Eric McDonald. No officer remembered arresting Eric at the site of the hospital, and none of the staff members recall seeing him either. The officers called for Eric's arrest at the hospital. When they went back to check the hospital, they covered all the doors and windows to prevent any escape. They checked all the offices and rooms for Eric. When they finally checked the last room, they breached open the door and found Eric's lifeless body sitting in an office chair. They found that there was a loaded needle in his arm and a gash across his neck. On his hand, there seemed to be long fingernails on each of his fingertips, and blood on his right hand. When an autopsy was performed in Eric's body, they found that he had overdosed on morphine, and the gash on his neck seemed to be self-inflicted using the nails on his fingers. Upon close-up, they discovered that the nails were not grown there naturally, but Eric had put them on there using medical glue. When the fingernails were removed from Eric's lifeless body, they found that there was blood on some of the fingernails. When they ran the DNA on the fingernails, they discovered that they belonged to the children and the elderly that died at the hospital. After all said and done, Eric's body was cremated and his remains disposed of.
The story had reached across the town and even further in the medical community. In life, they called him Eric McDonald, but in death, they called him Nails. Some say they still see him around in hospitals, killing people who need rest and are incapacitated. Some patients say they see the silhouette of a very tall man with very long arms and legs and very long fingertips. Some have even gotten heart attacks after seeing the sight of nails. Others have had their machines sabotaged or found very deep claw marks on their bodies. They say Nails doesn't know the difference between people who need healing and people who need to be put out of their misery. At the end, when some patients die, some of the living blame Nails. How'd you like it?